Superman had been around for 50 years by the time he appeared in this big screen adventure. The leap to an epic big budget movie would require a mammoth effort from not just one hero, but a team of them. Who are you? A friend. You will, hopefully, believe a man can fly. Superman. <laughs> Superman first appeared in comic book form in 1938, created by Jerry Siegel and Joel Shuster, and almost single-handedly popularised a new genre of story, the superhero. He would eventually make the leap to radio, serials, animation, Broadway and television. In the 1950s, the syndicated series The Adventures of Superman, starring George Reeves, was the gateway drug for many people who didn't read comics. The series introduced generations to the exploits of Superman and his alter ego, mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent. As a reporter, Kent was able to be in the thick of things, along with fellow reporter Lois Lane, just good friends, there was, there was none of that, and Jimmy Olsen, also just good friends. The series was a colourful kids show that ran for 88 episodes in first run syndication before Reeves' tragic death ended the series prematurely. Possible spin-off series were already in consideration before Reeves' death, such as a really classy and respectful way of expanding the canon. Can you read my mind? In the 1970s, producer Alexander Solkind and his son Ilya were making waves in the film industry, but not always in the best way possible. They'd had a hit film with their early 70s adaptation of The Three Musketeers and its sequel, The Four Musketeers, and were casting around for another big property they could exploit. I mean, make a mountain of cash. I mean, make a tasteful cinematic masterpiece. Superman. The younger soul kind suggested Superman, and since no one was really interested in doing superhero movies at the time, they acquired the rights relatively cheaply. But then the shenanigans really began. Warner Brothers already owned DC Comics, and therefore Superman, and although they had no interest in making the movie themselves, they would pay for and distribute the finished film. But this meant the soul kinds would be on the hook for the entire budget until the finished movie was delivered to the studio, hopefully for a summer 1978 release. Even then, the Saulkind's reputation was a little, how shall we say, shady. Alexander Saulkind was the money genius, while son Ilya considered himself the creative force of the partnership, along with his friend, producer Pierre Spengler. First, they had managed to produce The Four Musketeers out of thin air, since the cast of the first film thought they were only making one film called The Three Musketeers, and surprise, surprise, were only paid for one film. You're a genius. A naughty genius, but what the hell, nobody's perfect, right? Secondly, the Saulkind's finances seemed to be on a fairly rocky foundation, with Alexander Saulkind involved in all sorts of disputes, including not paying the director of The Three Musketeers, Richard Lester. Their method of getting finances for Superman was to throw big names at prospective investors and hope everything else fell into place. Now, call me foolish, call me irresponsible. They managed to get Gene Hackman and Marlon Brando involved in the project, and those names got people writing checks. They were even thinking of a big name to play the title role, but thankfully that didn't happen. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird! It's a plane! Jesus H. Christ, it's Bert f***ing Reynolds. Superman was originally meant to be filmed in Rome, but Marlon Brando still had an obscenity charge hanging over him from the last tango in Paris. Also, by this time, he was off dairy, so no butter, or the exchange rate favoured shooting in England, but there's no joke in that. With the move to England, the movie's original director, Guy Hamilton, had to excuse himself because he was by now a tax exile. What are you standing around about for? Move! The Solkinds hired various writing teams to write scripts, eventually getting Godfather author Mario Puzo to write some drafts, which is a bit weird because while The Godfather was an exciting and successful book, the actual prose feels like it has the rhythm of somebody reading out a credit card number. While I wouldn't necessarily give them my credit card number, the Solkinds, it has to be said, were not alone in Hollywood as being somewhat roguish. On Superman, they were taking chances and piling up expenses, faster than a dog accidentally buying Minecraft skins on your iPad while you were off in the kitchen making coffee. 
Richard Donner had had a huge hit in the mid-70s with the horror classic The Omen about a boy who was the Antichrist, but that somehow still didn't prepare him for what was to come. The Saul kind maneuver, writing a large check to someone who was then hot in Hollywood, but asking them not to cash until the 15th, brought Donner on board. He felt the existing scripts didn't get Superman and decided what was needed was verisimilitude. Basically, even if your universe is full of goblins, fairies and trolls, make your film as if everything was real. He brought on board former James Bond scriptwriter Tom Mankiewicz. By this time, so many writers had been engaged by the Saul Kinds that Mankiewicz was credited as creative consultant to get around Writers Guild restrictions. The script was coming together, the director was on board, sets were being built, but early on it was realised that the movie would live or die based on whether audiences bought whether Superman could fly. Previous versions of Superman tried various ways of making Superman appear to fly. Up, up and away! In the very first serial starring Kirk Allen, the film would suddenly turn to animation when Superman took off. In the TV series, George Reeves leapt out a window and then the film cut to the same few stock process shots. None looked particularly convincing and so the effects team tried a lot of different ways to make the Man of Steel appear to fly. There's desperation and then there's desperation. Okay, can we go for another take? Do we have any stuntmen left? What, all of them? Getting the effects right was one part, the other was that the actor playing Superman would need to make a great sales pitch that he was the Man of Steel. Another was the film's love story had to work, so the chemistry between Superman, Clark Kent and Lois Lane was very important. Various people were tested but one who stood out was a tall and gangly young unknown actor, Christopher Reeve. His screen tests were the best, but he wasn't then as physically impressive as you'd expect. Like when you compare a hamburger and advertisements to what you actually get. Reeve was sent to a trainer to bulk up and pretty soon the production was finally underway on two back-to-back -back Superman movies. Remember the time you tried to carry all 15 bags of groceries in from the car in one go? It's a bit like that, but without the slipped disc. Is that how a warp brain like yours gets its kicks? Though by now, actors guilds had insisted on something they called the Salkind Clause, which insisted actors knew how many movies they were appearing in. Superman the movie begins with a fairly faithful and lavish retelling of Superman's origin story. Krypton is about to explode and its leading scientist Jor-El sends his infant son Kal-El to Earth to escape the destruction. Kal-El's capsule crash lands in Kansas and he's adopted by Jonathan and Martha Kent who raise Kal-El as their own son, Clark. You are here for a reason. As an adult, Clark goes on a journey to discover who he is with only a leftover crystal from his capsule to guide him. To Clark's surprise, the crystal is able to 3D print a giant fortress somewhere in the Arctic. It's a sweet crib, all right, but the Wi-Fi coverage is pretty spotty. Who am I? Your name is Kalel. You are the only survivor of the planet Krypton. After discovering all his long dead father Jor-El can teach him, Clark rejoins the world and gets a job as a reporter for the Daily Planet and Metropolis. Editor Perry White is impressed by Kent's humility. But he is, in my 40 years in this business, the fastest typist I've ever seen. But star reporter Lois Lane eye-rolls her new colleague. There's only one P in rapist. Clark has an instant crush on Lois, who despite her lack of spelling ability, had all the moxie and gumption of a reporter who would get into all sorts of convenient scrapes and trouble. After Superman reveals himself to the world, oh come on, it's not like that. Super criminal Lex Luthor realizes he will need to put the Man of Steel on ice if he's to achieve his goal of destroying California in a real estate grab. Target zero, right here. Superman the movie walks a fine line between playing things dead straight, but at the same time keeping things light, but not too light. The danger is real, like a hot air balloon carrying the cast of Are You Being Served into the heart of the sun. I after all of the setup, the film proper really starts with one of the movie's greatest sequences Superman appearing in public for the first time to rescue Lois after a helicopter accident. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? The special effects just disappear into the background most of the time, like the turn signals on a BMW. Such was the care the filmmakers went to to not make it obvious how Superman actually flew. You pretty soon forget about trying to work out how each shot was achieved. Why are you here? There must be a reason for you to be here. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. <laughs> All right, so that'll be the day when a guy can fly, huh? Oh, I don't know. You'd be surprised. The cast are uniformly excellent. Reeve is perfect. He can swap between the nerdy, bumbling and meek Kent and Superman in an instant, like a quick changing bipolar polar bear. It's more than just a pair of glasses that marks the change between the two. And how big are you? How tall are you? Margot Kidder as Lois, in this film at least, has the perfect amount of mercenary energy as the star reporter, but also one who turns into a star-struck girl around Superman. The byplay between the two works perfectly, whether it's Lois and Clark. I mean, I've seen how the other half lives. My sister, for instance. Three kids, two cats, and one mortgage. Yeah. Or Lois and Superman. Lark, uh, who's that, your boyfriend? Clark? Oh, Clark. No, he's nothing. What doesn't work? Poetry. Can you read my mind? Oh! Oh! Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor delivers an excellent performance as Superman's longtime arch enemy. What, what more could anyone ask? Hackman's Luthor is merely a selfish sociopath rather than the outright psychopath of later Luthers. Lex Luthor, the greatest criminal mind of our time. Of our time? I hereby serve notice. He's serving those to you. That these walls. That these walls here. Will you shut up, please? please you. All right. And avoids the extreme mugging of Batman villains. <laughs> Try twist it. Maybe this guy that flies is just sort of passing through, you know? Ned Beatty and Valerie Perrine support Hackman as an idiot henchman and the gangster's girlfriend, respectively. All right, Otis, listen, it isn't that I don't trust you, but uh, I, I don't trust you, Otis. Marlon Brando, at the time getting paid huge amounts of money for a few weeks work here and there, does a good job in Superman, creating a Jor-El that's in sync with the material, rather than the rambling improvisation of his appearances in Apocalypse Now. I ask you now, to pronounce judgment on those accused. Jackie Cooper, who'd been a child actor but more recently had become a prolific TV director, brings us a new Perry White, forceful without ever becoming a screaming maniac. Olson, why am I paying you $40 a week when I should have you arrested for loitering? Mark McClure brought us a faithful interpretation of gee whiz news photographer Jimmy Olsen. But at least this version of Jimmy doesn't get shot in the head. Glenn Ford plays a version of Jonathan Kent who wisely stays away from tornadoes. Donna casts the picture well, with everyone staying grounded, apart from the characters who don't need to stay grounded. John Williams again provides one of his classic scores. In one of the few occasions he wasn't monopolised by either George Lucas or Steven Spielberg, his Superman theme is one of the most recognisable pieces of film music in history. Reeve, even after an accident left him paralysed in the 90s, cast such a long shadow in his cape that of the many, 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 many actors to subsequently play a live-action version of Clark Kent, few compare to Reeve. Not everyone necessarily thinks Reeve is the best Superman, but if you need help making up your mind, if you go to the website, compare the Superman and plug in your details, some mongoose in a smoking jacket with a dodgy Russian accent will contact you to tell you about the best Superman for your situation. Need a Superman with third-party flight collision and unlimited mileage? Go to comparethesuperman.ca forward slash scam dot refer forward slash stam dot fine forward slash identity theft. Mr. Sparker, when I was six years old, my father said to me, Get out. <laughs> Before that. Superman looks appropriately epic, but really has different looks for different settings. Krypton feels like an alien world. Smallville transports you back to the Midwest, and Metropolis gives you a New York substitute. But it's the petty crime-ridden shithole New York of the 70s. Without needing to write an appropriate segue, while the film came out great, how it was made feels like the end result was a bit of a miracle. I anticipated this, my son. You I... couldn't have. You couldn't have imagined how good it felt. The original intention was to make two Superman movies back to back, and that's how the films were planned out. They'd film all of the scenes in one set for both films before moving on to others, or all of the scenes requiring Brando or Hackman for both movies in the short windows they were attached to the project. But the Saulkinds were running out of time and money. The Saulkinds had to pay for production and hand Warner a completed film before being reimbursed. The money was running out and their creditors were getting antsy. See, he doesn't really want to hurt anybody. Uh-huh. 
right after I rip off this lady's purse. <laughs> of course. Deals were done, with Warner Brothers slowly gaining more and more control of the film in return for pumping more money into the project. It's like taking out a mortgage on your house to pay off a credit card bill. So, in order to avoid the spectacle of shirtless soul kinds, the decision was made, more out of necessity, to complete the first film before filming any more scenes for the second movie. The script for the first film was rejigged slightly to use the ending originally envisaged for Superman 2, with the thinking they would just come up with a new ending whenever they came back to finish Superman 2. However, relations between Richard Donner and the Salkinds had broken down to the point where director Richard Lester was brought in as a go-between, but most people seem to believe Lester was being primed to take over the production as soon as Donner could be ousted. All those things I can do, all those powers, and I couldn't even save him. But despite the pressure and politics, Richard Donner put his head down and got the first film done. And the result was truly magical. If you look up Compare the Superman Director, you'll see Richard Donner usually coming up as the top result, and for good reason. The Superman series started by Donner eventually ran for five movies, plus a Supergirl spin-off. The problem with Men of Steel, there's never one around when you want one. The film was a phenomenal success when it was released at Christmas 1978, and the Salkinds took the opportunity to clean house, getting rid of Donna and others before going back to finish Superman 2 with Richard Lester directing. That's a whole other story of intrigue. I certainly hope this little incident hasn't put you off flying, miss. Statistically speaking, of course, it's still the safest way to travel. I was really, really into Superman when this movie came out, like really into it. I recall leaving the theatre early because I had a headache, which seems to be my memory of every movie I saw as a very young child. Being led out of the theatre five minutes before the end, screaming my head off, ruining it for everyone else. It's interesting how some things never change. When the film came out, it was briefly fashionable for kids to dress as Superman. Here's my high school graduation photo, except that was taken about a decade after the movie came out. So in retrospect, that does explain the booing. Um, would you like a glass of wine? Uh, no, no thanks. I never drink when I fly. This Superman series would never again reach the heights of this first movie, with subsequent movies unable to match the pure joy of Superman the movie. Listen, there's something I have to do. I'll see you later. I can't stay still for a second. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.